Yet another episode of the Anxiety Rx podcast. I am your host, Dr. Russell Kennedy, and today I don't have a guest. It's just going to be me. It's just going to be me talking about what I feel is probably the most important thing to recognize in anxiety, which is that you don't have to believe everything you think. I think as children, we escape into our heads because it was the only escape that we had, dissociating from the pain in our bodies that was being inflicted upon us either directly or indirectly, usually by a parent. And the only place we had to go was our heads. So we'd learned how to overthink. We learned how to get some comfort. And I put comfort in quotation marks there. We get some comfort from going into our minds or even dissociating. Because it's just so painful as a child when you have no control over the situation whatsoever. And it hurts. The situation hurts. There is this sort of feeling of like, my God, like, what do I do here? What do I do? And you don't know because you're a child. You're a child. So you don't know what to do. So we get used to just going up into our heads, dissociating to escape from the pain of bullying or rejection or physical or emotional or sexual abuse. We just dissociate. We go into our heads and we start to worry and we start to worry looking to make the uncertain a little more certain. And if we, th- we think that if we can make a negative story out of the whole situation, that somehow making it make sense relieves the pain. And I think it does a little bit. I think when we look at the, the neurological structures, the periaqueductal gray in our brainstem, it secretes your own brain's natural morphine when you scare the crap out of yourself with worry. And dopamine, we secrete dopamine when we think we're on the right track. When we go from something that doesn't make any sense, like I wonder, I wonder if my mom's going to be drunk when I get home today. I wonder if my dad's going to be abusive. I wonder if I'm going to be bullied at school today. When we confirm that that's going to be the case, we secrete dopamine in our brain. It makes the uncertain a little more certain. And when we create dopamine in the brain, it's kind of like, well, it's not kind of like it is the brain's natural reward system. So we condition ourselves since childhood to worry because on some level, neurologically, we're rewarded by that. We're addicted to the chemicals of worry. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. We get addicted to the chemicals of worry and creating worry in our minds creates these addictive chemicals. So of course, We're going to do it again and again and again. And it kind of works in a way when we're younger to dissociate away from that old alarm pain in our body. Because it's just too much. It's just too much for a child. So when you can allow yourself to feel the pain now as an adult that you didn't allow yourself to feel when you were a child, you can start to metabolize it. You can start to see that it isn't all of you because when you're a child and you're in a situation that you have no control of, say you're being physically abused or bullied or rejected, it's a terrible place to be for a child. There's no resolution. And especially if the parent is the cause of that. And especially again, if the parent can't soothe you. And often when things are shameful in our childhood, we don't ask our parent for help because we're ashamed. We don't want to bring it up. Mel Robbins talked about that when she felt like she was being or holding herself. I'm sorry for not being a little more flow flowy with this, but it's, it's a, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So when Mel was, molested, for lack of a better term, by the older kid on the sleepover, she felt ashamed. And when her mother was making breakfast that day and she came downstairs, she could have told her about it. And I'm sure her mother would have reassured her and helped her process that. But Mel didn't say anything. And then that shame gets deeper and deeper into your system. And the deeper that shame gets, the more isolated you feel and the less likely you are going to share that old pain or that new pain. Whatever shames you, you will not share. 
and it gets stored quite quickly as alarm in your system, as alarm in your body. So when we get this alarm in our body, as children, we condition ourselves to go up in our heads because it works. It does give us the illusion that we are soothing the pain a little bit, soothing it a little bit by going into our heads and getting out of that alarm that's stored in our body. Just as, as the alarm was stored in Mel's body, she learned how to overthink and she became a world-class worrier, but she used it to get stuff done, but it does catch up with it. It does catch up with us. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, sometimes. This shame, this judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming of ourselves that we did when we were children catches up with us because the worry no longer works anymore. The worry just makes it worse now. We're still getting a little bit of dopamine and a little bit of endogenous morphine, but it pales in comparison to the pain we're creating when we believe our own worries. So today I wanted to talk a little about what I do when I get into alarm. And I think it's so important to be able to find the alarm in your system first and then be able to stay with it. I have this little thing, and if you've read my book and you've listened to the podcast, you know I have this little mantra called sensation without explanation. So when I feel the sensation of alarm with me, it's in my solar plexus. With you, it might be in your throat or your heart or your belly, or whatever. Find the alarm. And see if you can stay with it. Even if it's just for five extra seconds. And for some of you, this may not be possible because your abuse was so horrendous and so difficult to deal with. And that's the time where you need to actually get some help. A somatic therapist or an internal family systems therapist. Someone that can really help you process this alarm. Because unless you process the alarm, it's always going to fire you up into your head. It's always going to create the sense of dissociation where you're not grounded in your body and you have to go into your head looking for affirmation in any way you can of certainty. And of course, we know that worry isn't certain. We know that all worry is about the future. And all worry is just a prognostication. It's not real because by definition, it hasn't happened yet. All worry is about the future and all worry is not real because the future simply hasn't happened yet. So this is what I do when I get into alarm. And I still get into alarm. I, I say that my anxiety is healed, which I believe it is because I know exactly what, I, what to do now. I know exactly how to heal it when it comes up. Not saying I don't get a couple hours a day in a day every once in a while where I feel alarmed and anxious and semi out of control. But I know what to do now. I know how to get into that place of alarm, how to allow myself to feel it. Because that alarm is your younger self. And the more kind and compassionate you can be to the alarm, the more kind and compassionate you can be to that child that lives in you that was bullied, that was rejected, that was physically, emotionally, or sexually abused. The more connection you can create with that child, the more alarm in your body you will resolve and the more alarm in your res you resolve in your body the less you need to worry the reason we worry is to avoid that alarm in our body and i've always said that anxiety is a separation all anxiety is separation anxiety anxiety is a separation of your adult self from your child self the adult in you doesn't want to go back and visit the child because the child holds all your pain and the child doesn't trust the adult because the adult has left them alone for so long. Now, as adults, we don't often know that this is what's happened. We know that we feel this pain. We know that we feel this alarm, but we don't know that there's a child behind it. And in fact, a lot of people object to that inner child term. And I did for a long time too. And I find the people that reject the inner child term are often the people with the most inner child wounding. So anxiety comes from a separation of your adult self from your child self and your mind and your body. Your alarm is held in your body. So to avoid staying in your body and staying in with that alarm, you go into your head, you start worrying, you start ruminating because that is seen by your system as easier than dealing with the alarm. And I'm telling you that that will go on forever. It may seem easier in the short term, but it's not in the long term by any means at all. 
it is definitely not easier in the long term. Because the alarm just tends to get worse and worse and worse because the alarm is your younger self. It is the younger version of you that was abused, abandoned, neglected, had to mature too early. That is you. And if you can't connect to that younger version of yourself, you're never going to heal your anxiety. I don't care how much EMDR or tapping or whatever it is you do, unless you connect that adult self with that child self, you're never going to heal. You can feel better. Absolutely. Cognitive therapies will help you feel better. But until you actually connect the adult in you with the child, that wounded child, and show them they're seen, heard, open to, understood, loved, and defended, you're always going to be anxious. You're never going to be able to get out of that because you're not dealing with the underlying root cause, which is this alarmed child that still lives in you. That part of you is still there. It's still in your physiology and your physiology affects your psychology. I call this background alarm. This is alarm in your system from the background of your life. And it may not even be your life. It could be your parents' life. It could be inherited family trauma. There's a number of reasons why we develop alarm in our system. But the effect is the same thing. We, we, we go up into our heads, we dissociate into our minds and worry and ruminate to avoid this alarm that's in our body. So how do we stay with the alarm? Well, we put our hand over it. We breathe. We become really focused on our breath because when we focus on our breath, it slows down. We slow down our physiology. We kind of get into that vagus parasympathetic rest and digest phase as best we can because I realize that when you're in survival mode, when you're in alarm, it's really difficult to calm down. I know. I've been there thousands and thousands and thousands of times. But we really have to find the alarm. We have to find the alarm in our system. We have to put our hands over it. We have to breathe into it. We have to see it, hear it, love it, and protect it. We have to find that alarm and connect with it. Because that is the root. That's how you heal. All these other therapies that I see, they help you cope. But until you connect that adult self with that child self, you never get better. But it's difficult to stay with the alarm. It hurts. It really hurts. The analogy that I draw is cold plunges. I've been doing some cold plunges in the last six months. Not many, but a few. But what I realize is that I go into these cold pools. I haven't got to the ice stage yet. I just go into really, really cold water. And it hurts. It's painful. When you first go in, it actually physically hurts. But the big thing is, I know I put myself there. When I was a child, and I experienced my dad going off the rails and going crazy, and my house going into chaos, I had no control. It was just pain. It was just pure freaking pain. But when I put myself in a cold plunge, I'm doing it to myself. I do about 30 seconds of meditation before I go in, and I just allow myself to feel the pain. And I do have a point with this, so I'm getting to it. And it's the same with the alarm. The alarm hurts. People say, oh, you just have to sit with the pain. Just sit with the pain. Sit with the pain. It's like sometimes the pain is so great that you can't sit with it. But I'm saying, can you sit with it a little bit longer? Can you stay with it? Can you put your hand over it? Can you really, I know this is repetitive and it's repetitive for a reason. I do this, I create this repetition because at the end of listening to this little podcast I'm doing, you will have a different felt sense of your alarm than you had before you started listening. I can change your cognitive mind very quickly, but it's the unconscious places that hold your alarm, that hold your pain. That's what I need to get into. That's what I need to work around. That's what I need to change. So it's isolating. Find the alarm in your system. And once you've found it, treat it like a younger, wounded version of you. Try and support it. Try and talk to it if you can. Which feels really disingenuous. But I'll tell you, if you can go to a mirror and you can talk to your younger self, you can freaking do anything. Because that is one of the hardest things to do. But it's finding that alarm, putting your hand over it, showing that younger version of you that's represented by, represented by that alarm that you'll see them, hear them, love them, and protect them. And you have to stay with the feeling. And notice, 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 notice that when you feel the alarm, your urge 
to go up into your head and ruminate will be very, very strong because this is what you've been doing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years is when you feel the alarm and you may not be aware of it consciously. When you feel the alarm, you just go in your head and start worrying. Worrying is usually, almost always, from this source of alarm that's in your body. Worry doesn't just come up on its own. It can. It can. But by far and away, the leading cause of worry is this alarm that you're not even aware of. Like it just sort of sneaks up on you. And then all of a sudden you're caught in this cycle of worry. And when you're caught in this cycle of worry, scan your body, find that alarm. I can guarantee you that it's going to be there because probably it was there before the worry. And the reason why you're in a cycle of worry is because your body is alarmed. I have lots of people that say, you know, I had this worry and it really didn't bother me at all. And then I had the same worry later and it really scared the crap out of me. And I said, yeah, because the difference was your body. If your body's an alarm, everything seems way worse. That survival physiology of alarm shuts off your rational prefrontal cortex. It shuts off the rational part of your brain. So not only does survival mode in your body, cortisol, epinephrine, not only does it create more threat in your system, but it also shuts off the part of your brain that would tell you that these threats aren't really real. So you get double whammy. So one, we make up a worry, and then two, we believe that worry because the part of us that would tell us that worry isn't really anything major is shut off. When we bring our body back into regulation, we regain that rational mind, and we're able to see, oh, you know what? Yeah, I hope that doesn't happen, but it's not really. It's not really going to happen. It's pretty unlikely. So I know I'm rambling a bit today, but I really... This is the nature of the whole alarm anxiety thing is that it comes, it ebbs and it flows. It comes in and it, and it goes away. So it's like, can you feel it? Can you allow yourself to feel it? Breathe into it. Stay with it. It's really hard to do that. But this is sensation without explanation. And if you're able to stay with it for longer and longer periods of time, you start taking the engine out of the alarm anxiety cycle. So if the alarm is what's driving the worries and you start actually healing the alarm rather than immediately going into your head every time, and you start staying with the alarm, you start processing the alarm, and this hurts, this isn't easy. When you process that alarm, when you treat it as a younger version of you and you see it here at Love and Protect It, it starts to let, it starts to let you go. And Bessel van der Kolk in The Body Keeps the Score tells this story about how we're not teaching people how to get rid of their anxiety. What we are doing is teaching them how to acclimatize to their anxiety. He doesn't use the term alarm the way that I do, but basically what we're doing is we're showing you, yes, there is this alarm in your body. Yes, it is from your younger self. Yes, it hurts, but you can adapt to it. Just like I adapt to the cold plunge. Once I'm in there for two or three minutes, things just sort of settle down. It's like, I can stay here. This hurts. It still hurts. It's still painful. But I teach myself, I can stay with that pain because I put myself there. And if I want to, I can pull myself out. And you can pull yourself out of the alarm if you want to. What I'm trying to get across to you is the more you can stay with the alarm and keep a loving, caring, connected, Focus on that younger version of you that wasn't seen, wasn't heard, wasn't loved, wasn't protected as much as they should have been. Then you start, then you start healing the root cause of what we call anxiety. The root cause of anxiety isn't in your mind. It's in your body. So all these therapies that are trying to fix the mind only have a temporary effect. They do have an effect. They will make you feel better. But if you're not going at that root cause, if you're not going at that alarm that's stuck inside your body, that background alarm that I talk about in my books and my podcast, the background alarm is the real cause of anxiety. And if you can learn how to acclimatize to that background alarm, to kind of see it, hear it, love it, and protect it, and stay with it, and treat it as if it's a younger version of you, it will come around. It will eventually get to the point where you go, you know, I don't like this sensation, but I can handle it. 
And what happens now is that you don't like the sensation, but you can't handle it. So you go up into your head and worry. So what I'm trying to teach you is that you can handle that sensation. And if you can't, get some help because it doesn't get better on its own. Get some help dealing with that alarm and find a therapist who knows what I'm talking about. Find a therapist that deals in somatic therapy because all the cognitive therapy in the world isn't going to fix the alarm. It isn't going to connect your adult self to your child self in any meaningful, deep, unconscious root way because that's how we heal. We heal by connecting our adult self with our child self and our mind to our body. That's how we heal. Anything else will help you cope, but it doesn't help you heal. So what I'm saying is, can you feel this alarm in your body? Treat it, embrace it as a younger version of you. If you don't resist it and run from it, you have a chance to metabolize it. There is a term called integration, which is basically where we take disparate parts and move them into a functional whole. What's driving your anxiety is a bunch of disparate childhood parts that never got their needs met and they are hurting. So what we're doing is we're taking those disparate childhood parts. We're putting them into a functional whole by allowing that alarm to be there, by embracing that alarm, by staying with the alarm. And as we stay with the alarm, we start processing the alarm and we start being able to stay with the alarm longer and longer and longer. And the more we can stay with the alarm, by definition, the less we have to go up into our heads and worry. So sensation without explanation. When you're in, in your worried self, look into your body, find the alarm there and see if you can just embrace it. I know it hurts. And watch the compulsion to move into worry, to move into your head, to move away from this pain in your body and move up into your head. Because that's what's going to heal you. And it's not easy. It is definitely not easy. Even the unconscious parts of you will want to fire you up into worry before you're even aware of it. So if you can train yourself to stay with the sensation, to acclimatize to it, to even embrace it, you can start metabolizing that alarm. And as you metabolize the alarm, which is the true engine of what's causing the anxious thoughts, you've got no real need to go into worry anymore because you're actually dealing with the root cause of the problem, which is the alarm in your body, which is old, unresolved wounds that are still in you. And that's the only way I know to truly heal from anxiety instead of just learning how to cope with it. And I'll see you next time.